Exotic Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Uh, first and foremost, you know the routine. If you like what you hear, what you see, click the like button, click the share button, uh, and subscribe. If you believe in the work we do here at the Odyssey Project and Black Vo and the Black Voice, the work that I've done for more than 30 years, uh, show your love, show your support. Look in the description box and decide how you want to give to support. It takes researches. I mean, it takes resources uh, to do the work that we do. On that note, look, I'm going to get off into this. Look, I was contacted multiple times and I've, I've actually said no probably now for more than a week whenever it was it when it whenever it first came out that Drell Michelle had actually gotten pregnant by Jalen Green um, I was hit up and like what do you think about that there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of things being said from a lot of different directions what do you have to say about it I'm like I'm not getting off into that because it's a gossip uh, it's a gossip hot spot, but th then I started to look at it and when everybody would come to me and ask questions and there's so much that can be drawn out of this on so many different areas that are negatively impacting our community as a race. And it literally ties into what I shared with you yesterday as far as individualism versus collectivism in, ide in, 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 in an idealistic sense of what works and what doesn't and how the individualism is fed to us in a way that drives us to do whatever we want to do, however we want to do it. And it's just about us not understanding that the very uh, construct is created through uh, a societal push or a societal concept and construct that is basically oxymoronic. And what I mean by that is you're talking about being individualism, but the idea is being pushed by society, which in itself is represented by group uh, conglomerate activity. In other words, you op we are designed as mammals to function in a social uh, perspective in working with one another to take on goals and work in a collective manner to achieve something that's what we are designed to do we're not designed to stand on an island um, and function on an island and we're not even in a society that even promotes it in practice but we consistently want to push it so that we don't have to be accountable to the others in the group uh, but anyway what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down and for those who don't know what I'm talking about Drea Michelle is a uh, quote unquote, uh, and I'm not going to attack her uh, based on whatever she's done as far as her professional career. She's what she is. I know she's acted in some things. She appears a lot in pr uh, promoting merchandise on Instagram and places like that. So I guess you will call her Instagram model as well. But uh, she uh, definitely has appeared in some films. And so she acts. Um, what level and all that, I'll leave that conversation to you guys. Again, I'm not here for the gossip angle. I'm here for why this is a horrible thing um, on so many different levels. And there's enough um, culpability to be passed around. Um, first and foremost, though, I want to talk about something at the core of this. Um, Drea is this model who is 40 years old, who is dating or sexually involved with a 22-year-old 20, a player for the Houston Rockets uh, basketball team, and she has now become pregnant. It is getting a lot of traction for a couple of reasons. She's 40, he's 22, but she also has another son. Well, she has two two more sons. She has, well, I think, with the, 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 the kid she has with a lot. Uh, she has a kid with Orlando Scandrick, who used to play with the Dallas Cowboys, um, a professional football player. She has a kid with him. Um, 
and then she has an older son who is the same age as Jalen. So she's having a baby for a guy who is the same age as her oldest son. And um, when she's talking about this, they're asking her and, and, and she's saying in her interview that she's, she's liberated in her thinking. That's the new talk for, I don't have to worry about loyalty, commitment and settling down and building a family. I can just go out and have babies and co-parent. And that was pretty much how she said it. You know, you can just co-parent. You can just go up to, hey, you want to have a baby? She literally said this. You want to have a baby? I want to have a baby. Let's have a baby. We'll just co-parent. Uh, and she literally thinks like this is a 40-year-old woman who literally thinks that's a good idea. Well, it tells me that either she knows and doesn't care and totally out for herself or she is ignorant of the concept of child development, the concept of socialization, the concept of social awareness and efficacy. And so it is, it blows my mind when she says that, but she says that uh, she, you know, doesn't project long term. So, cause they're asking, you know, can you see yourself at 40 being with a guy that's 22 long term? And they're asking legitimately because long term doesn't come into a, a, a serious expectation just because you're dating someone. It comes into a serious expectation because you're having a child with that person. And the, the key word is not by that person or for that person. It's with that person. And we've got to really, truly start to pay attention to the semantics and the vernacular that's being used at any particular time to describe something because in that vernacular is the nuanced suggestion of what's acceptable and the media has always used that as a part of their pop propaganda uh, propaganda narrative. So here we are. And so she's got this idea that it's okay, right? So now what I want to do first is I want to make this clear that throughout history it has been the expectation of the woman and the woman's family that the man be a provider, that the man be able to provide security, environmental security, physical security, uh, financial security for the woman. So the idea that women are out here looking for men to cover them isn't off. And, and, and matter of fact, the whole idea of submission is under the guise or uh, under the expectation that the man is being a provider in those areas. In other words, I'm literally replacing your father as your covering. And we're talking about historically, that was a time that women didn't come from underneath the covering of their father until they could walk underneath the covering of a husband. And so that kept them protected. And, and the submission wasn't a subjection or a subjugation to uh, their husband, it was saying, I trust your covering. I trust your leadership. I trust that you have my best interest at heart. So I'm going to lean into you and I'm going to open up my gifts. I'm going to open up my spiritual womb. I'm going to open up my ability to discern things at a higher level than you because that's a part of my gift. I'm going to open up my insight. I'm going to breathe life into this vision you have and together we're going to ascend but i'm trusting you to take me where you say you're going that's what submission is about it's about men being where they're supposed to be and women trusting them enough to run to roll with them and uh so the idea that women are out looking for men to provide them security isn't uh a new idea or some failed issue in society. It's what women are supposed to expect. The problem is that in expecting that there has to be an equal exchange, not in the same areas, but in the same impact. And what I mean by that is when I come into a situation, whoever the per next, person, next person in my life is, when I come into the situation, my understanding is my responsibility is to pour into your cup, to encourage you, to lift you, to protect you, uh, to be a provider, um, 
to be a source of strength and protection. And I'm going to pour into your cup what I have. But you must understand that I come with a cup. And you need to be aware and understand who you are and what your strengths are and how you're going to pour into my cup. And that's the exchange. So when you hear men saying, what are you bringing to the table? And there's this new idea that, you know, I am the table. No, the table is provided by the man. He's asking you, what are you going to put on it? I'm providing the roof and I'm providing the table. What are you putting on it? What are you pouring into my cup? Because in order for me to be everything that I need to be to you, there are some there are some there are certain things I need from you, you know. And it and it and it, and it, it may not be money. It may not be uh, you to run the business. It may be you to fulfill what you naturally do well, and that's to affirm, that's to open up your womb, that's to breathe. That's nothing more influential with a man than being affirmed by the woman he cares about. He doesn't understand it all the time. He he might not even know when he's not getting it, why he's frustrated. But to hear a woman say, I love the way you do that. To hear a woman say, I really believe in you. To hear a woman say, we got this. I know we're going. You got it. You're, you're awesome. You're great. All these things drive a man. He can tell himself that he can push himself. He can be around his buddies and they'll say it. But to hear it from you, ladies, is unbelievably powerful. And we are constantly in an, uh, realizing we're in an era now where women want to withhold it. Why should we have to praise you for doing what you're supposed to do? Because my best is what I'm supposed to do. So there's never going to be a point where I'm not doing everything I can and it's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm never supposed to withhold what's good. So when I get to where I can do all this stuff that is considered extra, it's still what I'm supposed to do. So at what point do you tell me I'm doing okay? What At what point? Now, my manhood, trust me, my manhood is not contingent upon your approval or your verification, but it works better when that is happening. That is a part of you pouring into my cup. It encourages me. It inspires me. It fuels me. It drives me because there's nothing a man wants more to do than to provide. And if you, if you buy into this idea that we don't want to because that's the narrative being pushed, you're missing it. Because I'm going to tell you, men kill themselves when they feel they can't provide. This is my area. Men... Women, depression, men, for the inability, the feeling of it, of an inability to do what he's supposed to do, to not be the impact he's supposed to have, to not be able to come through, to feel useless. So the idea that we don't want to provide is foolish. So let's, I, I need to bring that part and break that part down. We want to provide. Now, here's the problem. We've been commodified and all you see is the financial provision. You're missing the emotional provision. You're missing the environmental provision. You're missing the fact that you are physically safe. You're missing the fact that there's these words of encouragement and, and, and edification being spoken into your life daily. All you can see is uh, uh, how many zeros in the account, or how many, how, how much of the bills can he pay? All of these different things without searching and understanding that. I'm going to get to commodification in a minute. But the problem isn't the woman seeking security. The problem is the deceptive ways in which she's doing it and the idea that she can do it, get it, and then move away and, that, and, and take these kids and put them in an environment where they're going to be sporadically around a major part of who they are, their father, their source of identity. There's a reason why historically women take the last name of men so that they can have the last name of their children because their children are going to take the identity of the patriarch. It's it's almost uh, inherently embedded and coded into our DNA. We identify with dad. We love mom. We'll, we'll kill for mom, but we identify with that. That's why you have so many people frustrated and searching and so many people angry. So people, so many people can't figure out things because the identity is through the progenitor. And I could get deeply into that and there are some people who will argue me that and I could pull you uh, pounds and pounds of empirical and pragmatic data to make my point, but that's not even the big thing here. But anyway, 
the idea that you can take that and you can do that and it's going to be okay now the crazy thing is she's not even taking into consideration the emotional impact that's going to happen here because see in the moral collapse it's go out and get whatever you have to do. In the moral collapse, there's this push of individualism. I don't have to worry about anybody but myself. And the very nature of who you are demands that you lean into others and others lean into you. It is the way that we remain erect, but we are driven to believe that I can make my own decisions. I can do what I want. No one has the right to tell me anything. And what happens is societal collapse is inevitable because society is built upon a moral construct that are the pillars that hold it up and the more that uh antinomianism becomes the way of being everybody's doing what everybody wants to do and nobody's adhering to any type of code then there becomes a disruption that becomes a flow it becomes a toxic environment and before you know it everything is falling around you and nobody knows why nobody knows why because nobody is paying attention and listening and those who see it don't want to acknowledge it. There's a reason why we're where we are, where we have so many kids killing one another, killing themselves, killing their parents and, 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 and everything. It's because of the disintegration of the family. You can follow it. You can you can follow it from the 60s all the way up until now. And you can see the direct correlation in the numbers as as family, as the number of Ooh. nuclear families in the black community go down, the, the amount of violence and criminality in the community goes up. And the crazy thing is you can say that it's it's poverty driven. Yes. Poverty influences crime. Uh, it, it's it, it's it's an inevitable thing where there's poverty. There's going to be crime. There's going to be violence. But what you can find is that. In the disintegration of the family, there is an impactful and emphatic uh, increase, a nuanced increase, uh, so to speak, uh, what's happening here. And it's because it the, fa the family is the institution in which the values, interests, and principles that will sustain the race, the community, the family is inculcated into the minds of young children at a time that they are highly susceptible to receive it and embody it and then developed in them throughout. And when you don't have both masculine and feminine energy in the house, you're robbing the child of an opportunity to get the best possible socialization they can get. Mom is built to do things and dad is built to do things. One can substitute for other in behavior and in responsibility, but not in the spiritual and emotional and neurobiological capacity that's necessary to produce a balanced and productive child, male or female. And so when you sit up and talk about, I can co-parent, now you're teaching irresponsibility, you're teaching the inability to be loyalty, the, 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 the uh, mindset to practice whenever I'm tired of something, I throw it to the side and move on to the next. You become a person that never finishes anything, never committed to it, never sticking to it because I'm not happy. I'm tired. I'm, well, the thing is, anything worth having is going to require you to stick it out. It's going to require you to go through some things. I'm not saying let somebody mistreat you. I'm not saying let somebody abuse you. I'm not saying let somebody cheat on you. But a bunch of the things that I'm seeing people skate on and walk on and uh, step away from relationships that should be anchored for is absolutely ridiculous. And what you get is the outpour of children that don't have the balance, that don't have the proper socialization. And that just is the, 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 the tip of the iceberg. This moral collapse also has produced a double standard. And nobody's definitely talking about that. Now, if that was a 40-year-old man, that's with a 22-year-old girl that was playing uh, ball in the WNBA. And he was finding some kind of way to uh, benefit from being with her. And she's obviously, uh, what I didn't put to that, she, while she's sitting up and saying that uh, it is, you know, whatever. And ultimately, I'm, I'm not going to be with this guy that long. She, uh, you know, and you see, all right, I've already got one kid by a professional athlete. And now I'm having another kid by a professional athlete. I'm creating financial security. I'm specifically targeting guys that have exorbitant amount of wealth. 
Um, and when it comes to it, that's where most of your black millionaires of any significance are going to be. Now, there are a lot of people who are starting to put together uh, a nice portfolio and have, you know, a net worth of seven figures somewhere along the line. I'm talking about multimillionaires that have high ceilings like this kid, Jalen Green, will probably, if he stays healthy and continues to play the way he plays, will probably by the end of his career have earned a minimum of $300 million. And she's going to get somewhere around 25% of that or more. Um, and the kid deserves everything, but the problem is finances don't fix everything. I work with young black males and females from 30 down that come from highly affluent families. A lot of my clientele are from ages, I think the youngest is 14 to 30. Now I have older clients, but I'm talking about specifically that applies here. 14 to 30 that come from affluent families that can afford to pay me my fees and I am a high ticket person. I'm not your average person, average kind of, I'm a high ticket person. And, and, and here's the thing, they have all kind of issues. You don't, your money does not exempt you from life. And money isn't going to exempt you from the failure to properly socialize. And it's probably going to hurt you because you're going to use money to bribe, money to cover the cracks in the orifice, in the development of the child, in the lack of a uh, solid relationship between the parents all that's going to be funneled through well here, here go do this here go get this look what i got you let's do this let's go here and the real issues don't get dealt with and so that's a problem then the commodification of the black man once again i'm gonna, I'm gonna move through this real quick <laughs> Every, every group uh, has an expectation of their men being providers. Um, the difference is for 70 years, 80 years after, uh, 70 years maybe, after um, the emancipation or quasi-emancipation of blacks in the south blacks black men had developed an ability to positively and effectively take care of their families um, they were the primary and in, 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 in many instances the sole providers in their home and these men were able to do that with less than a high school diploma it was because of the industrialization of the inner cities where there were warehouses and plants and manufacturers and uh, all of this stuff where they could literally go in get a job make a good living um, and and take care of their families and they de-industrialized in the 60s, they started the the industrialization of the inner city. They moved the plants out. They moved the warehouses out. They moved a lot of different things uh, out of these cities. And at the same time, they stripped out programs in the school system that taught welding, auto mechanics, um, wood shop, plumbing, electric electrical uh, being electrician and what that did is that took the ability to leave high school and immediately take on a job making a meaningful income those those mean those uh, uh, vocations still pay well most of those vacate vocations produce six figures uh, and you don't have to have a college degree to have it uh, but it's not readily available like it used to be and that wasn't an accident 
that was the crippling of the black family. This is laid out in a number of different ways. If you haven't read the Negro Family, A Case for National Action um, by uh, Daniel Patrick Monahan, um, more effectively known as the Monahan Report, you need to read it. Uh, he explained what would happen if the government kept going in the direction it was going in the way that it was dealing with the black family. He explained that the black family was a unique entity within the American uh, construct and that we had to be addressed based on our suffering as slaves, based on the need for our men to be able to provide for our families um, and so many other things. And it was ignored. Uh, by the Johnson administration to be exact. And so then we end up with this slow process where we're fighting. And the reason I say that is because all of this, can he pay all the bills? And, you know, I need this and I need a six figure man. And the truth of the matter is all of this grandstanding on social media, all of this, that and the other. And the truth of the matter is the median income for black men is the lowest of all men in America, and it's 44000 That's the median income. Uh, another statistic that we should know with all these flexors on the Internet is less than 3% of black men make six figures. Out of the 20-something million black men, only about 3%. Uh, somewhere, somewhere like that, 3 to 6% make six figures everybody else is somewhere under that and you have to understand that if the median income is forty four thousand there's some people making uh significantly less uh now the beautiful thing is we have this ability now uh almost at, the, at our fingertips to increase our value in any market we can train and we can get to where we increase our value and our earning potential and our earning ability. But there has to be a direction to do that at a level that we can get a significant number over a short period of time in uh, meaningful uh, employment, whether it's self-employment or whether it's working for someone else. That's something that we need to do collectively. But the whole idea that black men are just out there in the droves with the capacity to sit up there and take your own trips every month and do all this stuff like that, there are guys out there, but not at the number that you think. And it's nothing wrong with the men who aren't if they have a drive to be better. Now, can the guy who earns 44000 pay all the bills? Yes, but you don't want to live that lifestyle. He can pay all the bills, but that ain't the lifestyle you want. Now, 44000 that lifestyle of being able to pay out a bill, see, that, that's what I'm talking about, though, because what I can tell you is, as someone who has definitely earned over the top side of that, it's not just how much you earn. It's about getting with someone who understands that you're trying to build something, that it's not just about buying and shopping and all of these other things. It's about what are we investing in the business? What are we investing in the future for our children? What are we putting in trusts? What are we putting in the market? What kind of properties are we buying? All of these things are things that we should be having discussions about. Um, and I think that when we start doing that, everybody's going to be better. But the idea that you can just roll up on a brother that's already got it and just fall into it. Um, got black men, because we have been commodified, have become increasingly more aware of our assets. And what I mean by that is we have become cognizant of the... Number one, the uh, fact that when it comes to marriage, 80% of divorces are filed for by women. That out of that number, 
over 80% plus leave with more than what they came with and reduce our what? Net worth, which is how we're judged as men because nobody cares about how much we love. Nobody cares about how spiritual we cover, how emotionally supportive we are, how um, we, we really come in and do all the other things that men do, lead, provide uh, environmental safety and security and leadership and, and love for the kids. And all. Are you paying the bills? And so now that that's all that matters, that's how we're going to be judged. That's how we're going to get our pats on the back. That's that's all we care about. And then that creates competitiveness between us. So we're not working together now because we're competing with the other guy to be the guy because we want to be respected. We want the pat on the back. We want to be looked at. And the thing is, we're not developing as men because all we have to have is the bag. So the thing is, we could go on and on and on about this, but this all, this all is going to be exacerbated when you start having people on levels like Brittany Rayner and Drea, Michelle, and all of these others that are coming and saying, you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get pregnant. And it's not new. This stuff has been happening for a while. It's just gotten out of hand. And these young kids don't see it coming. While she's sitting up saying, oh, it's just the thing for now. This dude done got her name tattooed on him. He's in a different space. And that's the same thing. When I go back and I look and I say, you know, used to be like this. Hey, man, I'm going to be straight with these women right now. I ain't trying to settle down. I'm just doing my thing. And I'm going to go tell them this. Hey, look, ma, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm rolling. What's up? And I just want to let you know you're good. And she's going to say, hey, I'm good because she sees that you have some things that she wants to experience or she wants access to. She's going to say yes. She's not going to consider her emotional health. She's not going to consider her psychological health. She's going to consider you have something for me. And I had to learn that in those years back then that, you know, I've got something that'll make a woman agree to something that's not good for her. And just because she's agreed to it doesn't make it right. I had to learn. I had to sit there and say, no, the, the, the I blaze you, you blaze me mentality can no longer be a part of how I move because somebody's going to get hurt. And so it's got to be respect. If I can't give you what you need, I'm not going to be here. And I'm going to need you to think the same way towards me. And so what happens now is we've got all these people out here and it, it, it's no different. The idea that, you know, it's a man, so it doesn't matter. It's like this idea, you know, little boys can't be molested or little boys can't be manipulated and hurt emotionally and sexually when they're young uh, is what's got us in this thing. And, you know, and we've got to stop this men of big up in our boys because they, they, they having sex as teenagers. That's not going to help them in the long run. I know that's what happened to us. That's how we, you know, sort of gauge, hey, man, I'm growing up. I'm becoming a man. And the thing is, we didn't realize what we were doing, but now we have the knowledge and we've got to be willing to sit up and protect our sons because the things that can happen to them because they're out there trying to express their manhood, trying to get the notches on their belt. There are women out there that are sitting up and saying, I'm going to give you the notch, but I'm going to take something from you that's going to ha have multiple implications. I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your emotional stability because if you're you're young enough and you get with somebody and I do some things to you, you ain't never heard before. And I whisper some things in your ear, you ain't never heard before. All of a sudden you up in there and then you realize it was all a game. Games need to stop being played. Ain't nobody winning. Everybody's getting hurt. And so when I see this, it's just to me no different than and, and I don't think. I, I just said I don't think men should do it. And I, when I say I'm talking, I'm not just talking about if it's a big gap. I'm talking about if it's you're close in age, there needs to be an understanding and a respect for our women men that we're not going to run game on them because we need them whole and healthy. And if we're not ready for them, let them stay where they're at. 
for somebody who can come along that's ready for them because we need a strong community. And right now we're breaking each other down emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, physically. We are destroying ourselves because we are trying to play an individualized game in a highly social collective world and universe created for us to work together. And that can never be circumvented. The poor socialization of our youth is what produces the aberrant behavior that we observe, that we are so averse to, that we go, oh my God, and all the other stuff. It comes because we didn't prepare them. We didn't let them know who they were and what was expected of them and what they were capable of and prepare them when they were young to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and compete and win. We didn't compare. So they go out and they start flopping around. They start looking for ways to circumvent the process of earning and building and growing and lifting and learning and developing and becoming. And what do they do? They go out there and they try to get around it and they end up hurt. They end up, um, raising children by themselves that don't grow up and develop to become either. They, they end up in many instances in, in incarcerated because they're trying to skirt a system that wants to spit, chew them up and spit them out in the first place. We have got to understand that I have no problem with a woman wanting to be covered. I have no problem with a woman wanting financial security. I have no problem with a woman who has her own means demanding a certain amount from a man. What I do have a problem with is the deceptive means that we deal with each other, trying to get what we want without delivering what's necessary and not looking at the long-term implications. And I think the most important thing that has to be uh, observed here is that these children don't have a say-so in the matter. Yes, he's young and he's He's dumb and he doesn't get what's going on and he obviously didn't have the right people in his camp and then maybe he did and he just ignored it. But he's an adult. He made a choice, poor choice, because that's not what you want your seed to come up with. That's not how you want your seed to be in this world. But when the world around you is, is presenting this as acceptable, you don't know the difference. That's the responsibility of those of us who know is to start setting a standard, is to start being involved in a way that sits up and says, this can't happen. Little boys need to know who they are so they know how to perform what they're supposed to perform, but also what to demand and what to expect. It's no different than our baby girls. We are failing. So when I look at what Drea or Brittany and so many others have done, it's one person out there. I can't think of her name now. She's got four babies by four different professional athletes. That's the come up. And I know she's thinking that hopefully one of these will also become a professional athlete genetically, you know, uh, the genetic uh, possibilities increase. Dads, uh, highly um, athletic. And if you're somebody like Brittany Renner, who was a college athlete herself, and you get you an athletic person, you definitely increase the chance the child's going to be athletic. And then you just get in and you push them into a sport. They don't want to play, but you get them into it and you drive them and push them. And the next thing you know, 18 years later, you're, you're set for life. You got dad taking you to their 18th birthday then you got them taking you from there but you never brought anything to the table outside your womb i i don't and the thing is there is a growing number of people who think that's good hey you know that's the game you know that's how it's played you got to do what you got to do that hustle game destroys communities. It's an individualized, self-serving mindset that ultimately will burn you. Nobody walks away clean from that, from that grift. And that's what, it's a grift, it's a grift. She's hustling a lifestyle that she is in no way contributed to outside of her womb.
I mean, and it would be one thing if you get a, a girl pregnant and her whole mindset is to raise up a child and raise up a family and uh, you guys figure it out. And then, she, so she didn't just bring her womb. She brought character. She brought um, values. She brought this this ability to want to rear your seed in a way that you can be proud of and contribute to and be a part of. And that right there is different. She brought something that said, she brought to me, when a woman comes and says, I want to bear your children and rear them with you. She's coming in and saying, I'm going to help you pro uh, project yourself into the future beyond your life. And they will be a reflection of you and me, but they're going to, they're going to, they're going to reflect who you are in value, who you are in personage. And that is what we're not seeing when we go this route. It's like, Hey man, you know, this kid's dad is over here. And I mean, and don't get me wrong. Things happen. But when you go out and purposely say, look, I'm, I'm going to have multiple baby daddies. I'm, I'm going to, or I'm going to have multiple baby mamas. Purposely. It's hard enough in a world where nobody stays in a relationship to do it trying to be with one person. And now you're going to go out and say, look, I'm here as long as I'm here. When I'm gone, I'm gone. I'm just a liberal person. I'm a free thinker. I'm a free minded person. And what 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 got us here was that thinking is that there's no accountability. There's no need for loyalty. There's no need for commitment. There's no need for building and working and sustaining. It's just, hey, man, the moment I don't feel it, I'm gone. And it, it, and it's become a flex. But the problem is nobody's paying attention to the ramifications and the repercussions of the, uh, the, the total long-term outcome of what this type of society produces. You can look at it from a historical perspective or you can track it over the last 40 years now. We've got a problem. So for those of you that wanted me to come in and weigh in on that, that's my take on it. And I could go on and on and on, but I have other things to do. So that's it for now. You guys take care. I'm out. Yeah. They said I should give it up. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I want.